Well, Helen and George, welcome to Hard to Believe. Um, it's really wonderful to have you both. Um, I'd like to start just by get, getting a little bit of personal information on the two of you, especially in relation to your interest in um, studying the Romanovs. Um, and I know, Helen, your, your um, journey towards this role um, was a bit of an unorthodox one. Um, I'd love to have you talk about that. But go ahead and introduce yourselves. We'll start with Helen um, and, and then go to George. Well, I'm Helen Azar. Um, I am um, a librarian from New York who worked uh, um, at uh, Philadelphia uh, Public Library for about 10 years. And then I uh, immigrated to Australia. So now I live in Australia. Um, my um, interest in the Romanov started uh, years ago, probably like 15 years ago. And I have since published a number of books uh, with my translations uh, based on their writings. So I'm George Hawkins and I'm from Auckland, New Zealand. And since childhood, I, when I was a child, I saw a book at school. I was probably about eight or nine. It was about um, the false Anastasia. And it sparked an interest. And so basically, most of my life, I've had an interest in the Romanov family. Um, and as I've grown older and learned to speak Russian, I've begun to translate diaries, letters, and other Romanov-related material. Helen, your work as a um, a translator of this material. First of all, I want to I want to get a sense of how you came across this material or how you even access it because it actually surprised me when I first started looking into um, what we know of the Romanov family firsthand. It surprised me that there is that much material um, that still right. exists that, <laughs> that wasn't destroyed. Um, so, can you talk a little bit about first of all how you um, how you pursued access to um, these firsthand accounts from the family um, and and why they still exist? Well, uh, contrary to popular belief, uh, the the Bolsheviks and the Soviets didn't destroy uh, a lot of documents. They actually kept everything pretty carefully. Uh, the diaries and and letters or anything that was destroyed was done by uh, by the family members by 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 the uh, authors themselves who wrote you know who wrote these documents so um it, it's not really surprising that they've survived because they actually went out of their way to to save them in um, in the archives and everything was sent over to Moscow to a centralized archive where where it is uh, today still still in there today um the uh 15 years ago it was really hard to get access to these things you had to actually go there in person um up until even i'd say five years ago uh, it was still the case it was still very hard but then um uh, recently they've made it a lot easier where you can uh, actually do it remotely um, you don't have to go there in person. You can actually um, request it. It's still a little bit of a pain uh, because uh, of the um, just the logistics of sending them payments and things like that. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it's a lot easier now. Um, and I've even seen, uh, I've, I've gone to the archives and so did George. Uh, we've gone to the um, archives in Moscow and we actually saw originals. Uh, we had a, a tour uh, sort of like a backstage uh, tour of the archives, and and we um, we were shown the originals, and we we held them, we looked at them. Um, so things have have really changed, uh, and there's still so much more in there that we haven't uh, worked on, that we haven't uh, translated. Um, it's amazing. I mean, as much as there is out there now, that's that's done. Uh, there's probably a lot more than we have already worked on. So yeah, it, it's it's almost you almost need like several lifetimes to to do this. I, I'm I'm still curious as to as to why the Bolsheviks wouldn't destroy all this. And they 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 went so far out of their way to destroy the whole family and hide their graves and um you know sort of keep them a a, a phantom, right? It, it it's, right, it's surprising right. that they would allow allow this to to endure. Why do you think that is? Well, I mean, they were much like the Nazis. The Nazis kept every single record of everyone they, they killed, everyone they exterminated. I mean, mm -hmm. they kept all the records. Uh, this is how we know 
uh, how many people they killed. Uh, and I know there are a lot of people out there who deny it, but we have the records that they kept. So it, it's much the same. And um, just because the uh, Soviets saved it, um, it doesn't mean that it was available to to anybody. It was it was sealed. There were sealed archives. Mm-hmm, right. Uh, you couldn't look at them unless you were uh, you had to have very special permission to do it. Uh, no one, there was no access to the public uh, to them, so um, it wasn't um, it wasn't like they people even knew they existed. Um, it was only the the very very few people who knew they existed, but they kept them sealed. And uh, I'm I'm not sure exactly why they thought they needed to do that, but I think that it was maybe just in case, or I don't know. But they were pretty good uh, archive keepers. I mean, they they saved the, I mean, even their their belongings. They saved uh, a lot of their belongings too, not just their writings. So, you know, um, it it's just that they had a certain agenda uh, to do that, and and that's what they did. I think um, possibly at the start, some of it might have been being saved for a potential trial of the Tsar and Tsaritsa. But even so, there was so much more than just you know, pertinent letters or diaries of those mm-hmm. two that were saved. And yeah, and I would imagine also like some of their earlier writings were probably archived and, and put away during their lifetime as well. But yeah, so the, but there's a huge amount. It's an un- unimaginably large amount of material that is out there in those archives. Yeah, it's absolutely overwhelming. The the amount of boxes that are there, I don't I don't know how anybody could have seen it all, to be honest. Are you still digging through that stuff? I mean, are you still trying to access those things and and and, and write more books? Oh yeah. Yes. Yes. And and George's both of us are. So it's like uh it's it's uh it's it's a never ending supply. I mean like we could sit there and, and uh release uh one to two books a a year and, and, and do it for the rest of our lives, I think. That's how much material Absolutely. there is. Yeah. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the process of um, translation and how the two of you work together to translate some of these um, some of these works. I, I think a lot of people just kind of assume translation is like you look at one word and then you just you know do the English version of it, right? And then and then that's it. It's, it's very kind of straightforward and rote. Um, you know, it's not really how translation works. Um, yeah. how, how did you and George uh, first of all? sort of um hook up in the first place and 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 how do you work together to um to produce translations hmm. well george do you want to tell them how we how we uh met okay yeah <laughs> um well basically in the earlier part of this century um we were both involved uh, as you know, fans or people interested in the romano family on what's called the alexander palace time machine and um so we got to know each other through that and um and then Helen began doing her translations and 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 producing her books and you know, I would I would buy them of course and and read them and enjoy them and um eventually um Helen asked me if I'd like to be in, involved in the Maria book and said sure and um so she sent me through some files of um Grand Duchess Maria Nikolaevna's um writings diaries letters and I began working on translating them. Yeah, and and you know, like 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 we said, there was so much material uh, to work with that um, doing it alone is, it was a really hard task. Right. And um, I knew George for for several years, and and uh, I knew um, that he had uh, good Russian and he was a good translator, and that's uh, you know that's when we decided to. Um, collaborate. I want to talk a bit, bit about the family themselves and uh, the way the family, at least until recently, has kind of lived in the popular imagination. Um, like there's a lot of uh, revisiting the legacy of Nicholas um, in, in recent years, um, you know, away from sort of the knee-jerk reaction as just a, a tyrant um, to, to seeing his humanity and his flaws and, and, and so on. And, and of course, you know, Anastasia holds a certain place within the popular imagination for reasons that have almost nothing to do with her actual life. Um, right. Right. Uh, Absolutely. Well, but can, let's let's just talk about the Anastasia element of it though for a second too. Um, you know, I, I assume that that's something that has intrigued both of you at some point in your lives. Um, 
but you know the the relationship between the sort of fantasy of anastasia and the reality of anastasia um how how difficult is that for you to um to rewrite right because you have to sort of uh, gotta sort of change the way that people perceive things, right? Um, um, through these through these works and and through illuminating the the, the real family. Um, do, do you get a lot of people who initially sort of come to your work? Um, and this goes for both of you because of their interest in that story. Oh yeah, I think a lot of people who come to an interest in the Romanos through um, you know Anna Anderson's right. story. It might be. Right. Which, which sparks the interest perhaps I, I, like I mentioned earlier with that book at elementary school that w- was the thing which first put a seed in my head and I was only probably about seven eight or nine years old and yeah yeah I think the, I think the cartoon uh, brought a lot of uh, <laughs> uh, people in no definitely yeah. and then uh, yeah. some uh, some just said like oh great you know and they just sort of like took it for uh, took it for granted that that was the story and then others went on to research uh, the real uh, Anastasia and, and the real story and found out that oh no that's not really what happened and and uh, and that's how they got their interest uh, and uh, researched farther and and started reading about the other family members and and uh, you know they saw that that wasn't that the, the fairy tale was not really what happened um but uh but you know i'm glad that the cartoon kind of did it jo- its job and and got a lot of people interested you know go- going up through the 80s and early 90s and there were books coming out about anna anderson and you'd read them and you know sort of assuming or presuming that maybe she was the real mm-hmm. thing that you know sort of it was, it was interesting and i think that did bring people's interest or kept the interest in the romano family alive and but now sort of having translated um, Anastasia's real letters and and writings, and you can see it's such a different personality, a completely different person from mm-hmm. Anna Anderson. And, you know, the, the contrast is, is quite huge, to be honest. And But in a way, we've got her to thank for keeping th- this family alive in popular imagination for yeah. decades. Yeah. yeah, because if it wasn't for Anna Anderson, there would be no... Um cartoons or or movies or or uh, about uh, Anastasia and and it would just be uh, they may have been forgotten who knows but uh, mm. um, but but George is right I mean uh, she had absolutely nothing to do with with the real uh, girl uh, you know just based on on the, um, her writings and and uh, uh, you know even photographs or he had nothing to do with it, but she did keep her alive. So, so in a way, that's uh, th- that's the credit that she's due. So you've written about all of the siblings, and um, how would you describe as a as a collective? How would you describe the um, relationship between them? Because I, I, to me, what what's so fascinating, and, and the reason that I'm I've become kind of fixated on on Maria, especially, um, is is just how normal they seem um how relatable they seem um as much as a a century old um aristocratic you know um imperial family could possibly be uh, they 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 seem like a um like teenagers and children and you know and 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 that uh, that really um strikes me and maria especially i think maybe because of the age that she died and sort of um, what she lived through in her adolescence um, uh, speaks to me, but but uh, we'll get back to that in a second. I, I'd like to just talk about what you make of the how we, how you describe um, the sort of sibling relationship between um, between the Romanovs. Well, um, a lot of um, Western authors, for some reason, like to present them as uh, being really sheltered and they only had each other, and and they sort of. Um, lump them together as one they're sort of like interchangeable uh, which nothing could be farther from the truth they uh, haven't uh, th- th- first of all they weren't um, isolated at all and and they they interacted with a lot of people so they didn't just have each other as uh, companions they had a lot of other uh, people they interacted with including people their own age um, uh, including um, young men um, and young women. Um, as far as them um, 
uh, relating to each other as siblings. Uh, they they were they were normal uh, they were normal siblings. To be honest, they fought. They uh, they uh, said things about each other. They, uh, you know, not so nice things. <laughs> um, they <laughs> they gave each other nicknames, uh, but they also really loved each other. They 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 got along um, when they when they weren't fighting. Um, the, uh, the 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 little pair and the big pair, uh, the Olga and Tatiana pair, and uh, uh, Maria and Anastasia pair. That 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 part is true. Um, and they did, uh, they were closer to j just age wise. And um, uh, they did things uh, together more as, as pairs. Uh, but, uh, but they also did uh, a lot of things together um, as the four of them. And even in, in their diaries, they would uh, refer to themselves as we four, but at the same time, they didn't, um, mm, they 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 didn't think of themselves as just part of the we four. They 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 were they each had uh, their own individual personalities and their own opinions and 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 their own uh, um, just they they did their own thing too. So um, that was part of the reason of why I we decided to do a book uh, for each sister is because they've been lumped uh, together for so long and and. Um, you couldn't really see their individual personalities, even though they've been described as uh, this one is this way and this one is that way. Um, you really need to read their own um, uh, enough of their own writings to to get to know them, so to speak, individually. That's right. And um, one thing I think is that during someone's individual lifetime, say a member of imperial families or royal families, the ordinary people do tend to put them up on pedestals and not really see them as being real, you know, if everyday kind of people with, you know, normal human emotions and everyday lives and, you know, and, and yet they are. And, you know, they had to do their studies just like everybody else. And like Helen said, they had their arguments, their sibling bickerings and things like that. And, and you know, lots of other times when they did lots of... Crushes on boys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. So, <laughs> Right. So, so, and it, it, like I said, it's, it's easy enough to forget that you know, underneath all that, they are just ordinary people with you know ordinary emotions, and you know, their everyday life might be different from ours. Of course, mm -hmm. it is, but they still had you know ordinary human lives. And there's a lot there's the interest in that human human nature, everyday lives, and that's I think that's what makes it relatable. You know, hundred years later, I think you, you can see yourself in them or you can see people that you know in them and they're relatable very mm -hmm. relatable yeah they didn't even like being referred to as as uh grand duchesses right. or, or your your imperial highness or, or they, they hated that they just wanted to be called by their names or maybe names and patronymics but uh they, they just really uh they wanted to be normal i think they, they actually did want to be normal uh, as in mm. everybody else not not grand duchesses who are completely different from other people and, and they were they were normal <laughs>